Welcome to um, this episode of Evidence of Greatness. Um, in this episode, we're going to talk about a study by um, Bebak Nip, Salinas Puchol, and Martin Del Rio. And this study is an amazing study. Um, and it's entitled Bibliometric Differences Between Weird and Non-Weird Countries in the Outcome Research on Solution-Focused Brief Therapy. Now that title is a bit weird in and of itself, but um, hopefully as we go through this, it'll become really, really clear as to why, um, why the title is the title. But um, I wanna begin by just orienting you to, this is a, this is a really cool study um, and it tells us a lot about the current research that's available um, about solution-focused brief therapy. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is um, they talk about um, areas that kind of do a literature review about the research around, uh, that's available about solution-focused brief therapy. And one of the things that they outline is that solution-focused practice has been used in all of these different arenas, right? So psych therapy, social work, child protection, coaching, nursing, organizational consulting, and so on, right? So what we think of traditionally as solution-focused therapy um, really has changed and broadened, and now it's kind of considered solution-focused practice in all of these different areas. In addition, one of the things that they highlight is that across all of the research, that the research in some demonstrates that the outcomes are equivalent to those of alternative interventions, which means that when we compare solution-focused brief therapy to something else, um, they, they produce equal, equally good outcomes, both at the time when the, at termination, which is when the therapeutic relationship ends, and at follow-up. So if we call these people later and we say, so have the, have the changes that occurred, have they sustained? Then people typically are saying, yes, they sustained just as well as those approaches um, that use a diff uh, are different approaches, right? So basically what this is all saying is solution-focused um, work is being done all over and it is effective. <clears throat> So when we get into the nuts and bolts of this study, what they did is they did a huge literature search, right? And they, they looked for um, across a bunch of different um, platforms where you can look for research. They searched the term solution-focused brief therapy and solution-focused therapy. And what they were looking for is articles that were done research articles that were done where they were testing the effectiveness or the efficacy of solution-focused therapy. So they use these four criteria and they said, the research has to be original research. It has to be published in a scientific journal. It has to be about outcomes, which they were kind of delineating between outcomes and process research, which basically says, um, explains what happens during the process of a session. Right. So they wanted to look at outcomes where it says, did it work or did it not work? How well did it work? Those kinds of things. And then the fourth criteria that they included was they had to be about at least one component of SFBT. So this could be about something like the miracle question, or this could be about something like scales or something like that. But it had to include at least one component of SFBT and um, it had to be outcome research. Right. So when they did these searches, they searched, searched in nine different databases. They originally came up with 2,251 different articles. Some of those articles that they found were duplicated, right? Because they would find it once in one um, database and they would find a, a different, the same article in a different database. So once they removed the duplicates, they were left with 1,144 articles left. At that point with that 1100 articles, they then reviewed each of the titles and they reviewed each of the abstracts to say, is this really about solution-focused brief therapy? Does it fit into these different categories of inclusion that we have, right? And that then left them with 616 um, articles left. Then from there, they did a full review of each of those 616 articles 
and excluded some because they no longer fit or they weren't about what they thought they were about. And ultimately they came to, they had 365 articles that were research articles about solution-focused brief therapy that they can include. They also got some of these articles from the Solution-Focused Brief Therapy Association's list um, of evidence um, of articles that were there. So they wanted to just cover all of their bases. So in essence, they end up with about 365 articles that they're reviewing. Now, what are they reviewing for? Basically, what they're reviewing is what, where does this research come from? Who's doing this research? What is this research about, right? So they categorized, um, in essence, where is this research coming from with this acronym WEIRD, right? And they labeled some countries WEIRD countries and some countries non-WEIRD countries. Now, the way that they determined which ones were which is by this acronym. First of all, they looked at, are they Western countries, right? Do they adhere to kind of Western culture, Western ideals, those kinds of things? And they, and they decided that the countries listed here, the countries in North America, the countries in Western Europe, Israel, Australia, and New Zealand, those were considered Western countries, right? So that was how they rated it on one criteria, Western or non-Western. The second criteria was educated, right? So they looked at the United Nations Development Program and that program rates across human development, very highly educated, highly educated, average education or low education, right? So then they would rate again, each of these countries based on what the United Nations was saying about the education process in the various countries. So then they would rate those countries. The third criteria was an industrialization, right? Were they industrialized countries or non-industrialized countries? And the way that they use this is they looked at the International Monetary Fund database and they looked at the economies of these various countries. And they said, are these, are these economies robust and advanced or are they emerging economies, right? So again, that kind of helped delineate. And then the fourth criteria is rich, right? And for this, they looked at the global wealth data book and countries there are, are categorized as high income, middle, upper middle class, lower middle, or low, right? And so again, like this is the country as a whole. And then finally, they looked at democratic, right? Democratic countries. And they looked at the, dem dem the democracy index. Um, and what they did, which I think is really valuable, is that they said, um, democracy will range, right? There will be points where people or countries adhere to a democracy more and then less, right? It, each country is kind of developing and sliding forward, sliding back um, along this democracy scale. And so what they did is they looked at from 2006 to 2020, what was the average rating that each country got? And then they used that average rating. Um, so then they were categorized as fully democratic, flawed democratic, a hybrid regime or an authoritarian regime, right? And so each country would get a rating um, on, on each of these five categories. If you look at the article, you'll see um, a table that includes each of the uh, countries where research comes from and their rating on each of these five scales. So then what they did is they took the rating from each of the five scales and then they, they made a final determination. So do they fit the criteria for a weird country or a non-weird weird country? Um, so if they're a weird country, then they met many of these criteria. If they did not, then they did not meet these criteria. So that's how they were determining weird versus non-weird countries. So the results, right? The results of this weird um, demarcation. What they determined is that solution-focused research originates from 12 weird countries and 21 non-weird countries. And these countries cover what they call the five continents, but I will actually say six continents because here we demarcate North America and South America. And in the article, they kind of clumped the Americas together. Um, so the research basically is coming from all of the habitable continents. 
one of the things that then they looked at is they said, so how many of these articles are coming from each of these? 175 or about 48% of the articles came from weird countries and 190 or about 52% came from non-weird countries. So think about what that means, right? What that means is more of the research that we have currently about solution focused brief therapy is coming from non-Western countries, lower educated countries, less industrialized countries, um, lower economic countries, right? Um, less democratic countries. Um, so, the, what that says is the research, it's coming from all over the world, which is a really good thing for solution-focused research. Instead of it being centralized in one place or about one specific group of people, what this is saying is we have research that's covering the entire globe. So that's really, really valuable and important. So then they went in and they, they showed what percentage of the research is coming from each of the different countries, right? 44-ish percent is coming from Asia. And you can see the four most common countries in Asia that are contributing to the research is China, Iran, Turkey, and South Korea, right? 28-ish percent um, of the research is coming from Europe with the four most common countries being the United Kingdom, Finland, Netherlands, and Lithuania. And then 21% of the research is coming from the Americas, with the two most common countries being the United States and Canada. 4% of the research is coming from Oceania, and about 1.5% from Africa. Um, so that's kind of where you can see the research is coming from, right? Overall, now this I think is really also very important, 75% of the studies came from eight countries, um, the United States, United Kingdom, Finland, Australia, and the Netherlands are the five weird countries of the eight, and the three non-weird countries are China, Iran, and Turkey. Um, so you can see that <clears throat> much of the research is, it's kind of divided, um, some from weird countries, some from non-weird countries, and what's interesting also is that only 17 of the 365 studies were conducted by authors that were in different countries. Um, and that's, I think, really valuable or as valuable information because in essence, what that means is we should potentially be doing more international studies where we can say, um, when we do the same protocol in different places, does that make a difference? So that would really enrich our research if we started to do international collaboration. So that's kind of where the research is coming from, which I think is really fascinating and important to kind of understand um, what's going on. In addition to that, the, they kind of looked at the trend over time, right? And they said, over time, um, what, what does, where's the research coming from? And they said the first published study came from a weird country in 1991. And a few years later in 1994, that's when the first non-weird paper or non-weird country paper was published. Um, so that's really important and valuable because it, even from the beginning within the first three years, research was coming from both, both parts of the world. Now, what's really interesting is that at the beginning of time, um, beginning of the research, weird countries were producing far more research than non-weird countries, right? So not non-weird study publications really accelerated once we hit the year 2013, right? And between 2013 and 2017, that's actually when non-weird studies and weird studies became kind of equivalent, about 50% were coming from each of those regions of the world, right? So when you look at it, and again, there's some really remarkable graphs in the paper. So I would recommend kind of getting access to the paper and using, using the graphs, but they kind of chart weird country um, literature and non-weird country literature, and they show the trend over time. From 2003, when the non-weird research, non research was published kind of on a regular basis to 2012, 
the ratio from weird from non weird to weird was for every non weird study one study weird countries would produce three and 3.4 studies. So you could see in that 10 year period weird countries were producing far more research than than non weird countries from 2013 until now the ratio has actually shifted to 2.3 studies coming from non-weird countries to every one study that's coming from a weird country. So right now, non-weird countries are producing double the amount of research that weird countries are producing, which again, I think is really, really valuable because what we want to know is that solu the solution focused approach is applicable to many different populations, many different presenting problems in many different arenas. And what this is showing is that that is indeed what is what's happening is that solution focused brief therapy is being used all over the world. Um, it's being used in places that we would expect it to be used and it's occurring in places where we might not expect it to be used. So non-weird countries are actually producing far more research than weird countries at the current time. So when we look at um, who's conducting the research now, right? There are, of all of these studies, the 365 studies, they are comprised of 969 different authors, right? So each paper could have more than one author, right? On average, the publications per author is about three and a half papers, right? Now they did divide and they have a further table where they have the top 14 researchers who are producing outcome research. And you can see here that they then, they rank order them by how many studies they contributed to. And they labeled the top five, the five great producers. And you can see four of the five come from Finland, which is a weird country. And the other is um, here in the United States, which is also a weird country. Um, so the top five producers all come from weird countries. If you look then at the top 14 researchers or the top 14 contributors to research, um, all but three come from weird countries and three of the top 14 come from non-weird countries. Um, and so that's kind of how that breaks down. So even though non-weird countries are producing more research, um, uh, they don't have very many researchers that have produced a bunch of studies like the weird studies have, or like the weird countries have produced. Part of that would be time, right? Um, it's only been since 2013 where non-weird studies have outnumbered weird studies. Um, and so part of it is that there just hasn't been enough time for that research to come out yet. Um, but what that all spe also speaks to is that the, mo that the modal number of studies or the most common number of studies that people contribute to is one. Um, so this is research done by lots and lots of different people um, from around the world. Now, this is kind of a difficult chart to look at. A much clearer version of this chart is in the article, but I wanted to include this information um, because I wanted you to see um, something else that's really important. So you can see up here at the top, there are 365, whoop, sorry, I'm moving that, 365 studies that comprise, that are comprised of 35,818 individuals. So there's 35,000 people who have been participants in solution-focused research. They then divided these studies into clinical studies, which is predominantly psychotherapy versus non-clinical studies, right? And you can see what's really fascinating is that it's almost, the number of studies is almost identical. There are 182 clinical studies and 183 non-clinical studies. You can see, however, that 21,000 of the participants were in clinical studies and only 14,000 were in non-clinical studies. Then you can see further, you break it down in the clinical studies, oops, sorry, in the clinical studies, 
86 of the studies were done in weird countries and 96 were done in non-weird studies. So again, even in clinical studies, more have been done outside of weird countries than inside of weird countries. However, when you look at the number of individuals, there are almost double the amount of individuals in weird country samples versus non-weird country samples. What, that, what this means is in non-weird countries, the sample size is smaller, which might be an indication of the amount of money it takes to do a research study. So they may not be able to get as many participants. It might be that these are pilot studies or these are the first studies that are being done in these areas. And so they're just taking as whatever sample they can get, right? So even though there are more studies from non-weird countries, the number of people participating is less, but still 7,000 people is a big sample size. Um, when you then get into non-clinical samples, they divided it into these five different categories, right? So there's with people from the general population, um, primary or secondary school students, university students, company workers and social service users. And then in each of those categories, you can see that they broke down how many total studies. So there's 86 general population studies, 25 university student studies, 14 company worker studies, et cetera. And you can see how many individuals are, conduct, are contained in each of those. So you can see by far the most, um, the most individuals fit into that general population, 8,000 general population participants. Then what you do, you can look at, are they coming from weird countries or non-weird countries? You can see in the general population, um, the number of studies is equal, 43 from each type of country. Um, in the primary and secondary, secondary schools, there's actually more non-weird student studies. Same in university, there's more non-weird studies. Um, it's almost equivalent in the social service, um, but when you get to companies, um, weird countries outnumber non-weird countries, which might make sense given that it's industrialization, um, economics, those kinds of things. Um, but again, you look at the sample sizes, and in most cases, the samples in the weird countries outnumber those in the non-weird countries for the same reasons that we, that we talked about before. But what this shows overall is that the solution-focused approach is being used in lots and lots of different, in different arenas, right? And there are a lot of people who have gone through solution-focused brief therapy um, and, and different approaches. Go back to that very beginning part that we talked about, right? right? That it shows across all of these samples, it shows that solution-focused brief therapy did just as well as other approaches both at termination and at follow-up. So when you take that and combine it with this, we're saying these people from lots of different countries, from lots of different arenas are getting better and they are staying better. Um, so that's really valuable information that we're getting um, from this study. So then they go on and they say, so what, are the, what does that mean? What do these findings mean? So this is kind of a summary of some of the findings. Non-weird majority papers means that this can be applicable across cultures. The fact that there are more non-weird papers than, than weird papers means this is applicable across many different cultures, right? Second, um, this doesn't need to be adapted to meet the needs of various cultures. Solution the solution-focused approach can be used across cultures in a really meaningful way um, without much adaptation, which I think is really, really valuable. Um, third, they say almost the equal number of studies between clinical and non-clinical samples. And this means that it has reached far beyond the way that it was originally conceptualized as a clinical approach, right? Now it's being used in various settings. And perhaps they, the authors of this study say, perhaps we should start calling it solution-focused practice rather than solution-focused brief therapy, um, which is a really valuable contribution because so many of these studies have been done outside of a clinical realm, right? Fourth, they say, because only 6.9% of the participants were college students overall, which is drastically different than much research that's been done on psychotherapeutic approaches, 
that really what they say is this works in real world settings. When real people who aren't students, who aren't getting extra credit, when they participate in the solution focused work, they tend to get better with their real, real world problems. And then finally, they talk about how non weird studies may actually be underrepresented, even though there are more of them. And this might be because they don't have access, the researchers who did this study didn't have access to databases from many of the countries like China and Iran and Turkey. Um, they didn't have access to those databases where a lot of that research might be pub published and stored. And therefore they might not have been able to find all of the studies from those countries. Um, and so even though there are not more non-weird studies, um, it's valuable to know that that number might even be um, underrepresentative. And then finally, here's the official reference for the paper. So I just wanna take a second and just say, um, this study is such a valuable study because it's showing us that solution focus works, that it works with lots of different populations from all over the whole world, that it works within different um, settings, right? In clinical settings and non-clinical settings. It shows us that, um, that it's working um, in areas where we may not have known before. Um, so um, this paper um, is a foundational paper that we should all be talking about, that we should promote with our agencies, that we should promote at our universities to say, look, solution-focused practice works. Um, so if you've ever been questioned about that before, this is a great paper to go back to and to show people um, there's a lot of evidence out there that says this approach is a meaningful, effective approach. So I hope that was helpful for you today and um, looking forward to hearing about your comments and feedback.